of you brave going out and trying to see the eclipse? Did anybody try? Where I was, I couldn't see it because of all of the clouds, but what an amazing event to actually see the moon move its, across its path and actually cover the sun, but even in covering the sun, there's still the perimeter of the light as it shines forth. And as I thought about that solar eclipse, I, I really thought about our nation and what we're seeing today. Because as I, as I watch what's going on, both in our political system and our moral fabric, as I see the events going on all around us, it really seems as though we're, we're facing an eclipse of evil, doesn't there? It just seems as though the darkness is moving across the light and the light is being drowned out, if you might say it that way, by the darkness of the evil all around us. And we're not certainly the last one. Um, I'm on, he's fixing them there, I think, right now. So I think he's, are the things not working there? She was noting hers was not working over here. Yeah, my, it should be on, isn't it? Cute. My wife's told me what to do. All right, I was teasing there. But, but I also thought about Israel. Israel had certainly known times of moral eclipse as well. If you think back to the days just before the Babylonian captivity, moral decay had declined upon the nation of Israel. They were going down the tube literally morally into a state of decadence that, that God finally brought the judgment of the Babylonians. Israel was taken away into captivity and then they returned from exile and you would think that that would have been a time of triumph. You would have thought that would be a time of victory, of celebration. But it was really a time of humiliation as they faced the daunting task of trying to rebuild their city and they saw the rubble lying around them and they began the building of the temple but stopped halfway through because there were so many other things that they needed to do and then also they got caught up in their own little world and so they were again facing a, a spiritual decline. They were being ridiculed by their neighbors neighbors all around them. The wall was still in shambles all around them. And you can imagine if today's news media existed back then, what the nightly news would have been like in Israel. Can you imagine it? It would be so negative. It would be so pessimistic. It would be so dark and, and discouraging every night. Well, today, folks, once again, Israel was scorned and mocked by their neighbors. Once again, nothing was done on the wall. Look at the picture of the temple today. Nothing has been done on it. We're still in moral decline. We're still in economic decline. Evil had eclipsed the nation of Israel. And yet in the midst of all of that, there was a singer. There was a singer who sang a song. And his song went like this, the Lord reigns. He is clothed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. His throne is from of old. He is from forever and forever. The floods have lifted up, O oh Lord. The floods have lifted up their voices. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of the many waters. Mightier than the waves of the ocean. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. And holiness befits your house forever and ever. What a contrast. In the midst of the darkness and the gloom, this psalmist stands up and says, The Lord reigns. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 93. Because that is the theme of Psalm 93. And 
we believe that the context was actually at the time of Israel's return from the captivity and in the midst of their darkness, in the midst of their eclipse, in the midst of the decadence, in the midst of the devastation, in the midst of the destruction, in the midst of the depression, this psalmist cries out and says, the Lord reigns. The Hebrew word for reigns there is maldak, and it literally means Yahweh is still commander-in-chief. Amen? He is still commander-in-chief. He is the chief executive. He is the one who is ruling over all. And it's really the message we need to hear today as the church. I thought it was befitting that we sang so many songs that talked about bowing the knee and remembering who he is. Because in the midst of this eclipse that has seemed to come across our nation and across our world as we look at what's going on, and, and I have to say in my lifetime I've never seen it as dark as it is right now. That in the midst of it all, the church needs to hear again, we need to hear again, that our God reigns. Amen? Amen. Our God reigns when the church is on the move and growing, and our God reigns when the church is under assault from culture and even the government. God reigns when the mother takes that little child, as we sang in the song a moment ago, and holds that little girl in her arms. And God reigns when she lays that little child into the casket and they lower her little body into the grave. Our God reigns. Our God reigns when a person is healed of cancer, and our God reigns when they lie in the hospice bed and they breathe their very last. Our God reigns when our business is growing and thriving and prospering, and our God reigns when after 20 years of faithful service to our company, we walk in to find out that we've lost our job. Our God reigns when a Republican takes the office, and our God reigns when a Democrat takes the office. Amen? Amen. Our God reigns when we begin our new job, and our God reigns when we leave that job. Our God reigns when the economy is on the upswing. Our God reigns when the economy tanks. Our God reigns when our child graduates with honors from high school, and our God reigns when he barely gets out of high school. Our God reigns when our dreams come true. Our God reigns when our dreams crumble to the ground. Our God reigns when the couple walks down the aisle as the sounds of the church bells ring and they take their vows to love each other forever. And our God reigns when the sound of the gavel hits that wood as they walk out of the divorce courtroom. God still reigns. Our God reigns when we walk into our newly built house and our God reigns when we walk through the charge remains of what is left of our home. Our God reigns when the sun rises over the horizons, and our God reigns when the storms and the clouds of a Hurricane Irma begins to appear over the horizon. Our God reigns when ISIS advances its bloodbath, and our God reigns when ISIS is finally defeated. Our God reigns when we're young and vibrant, and our God reigns when we're old and feeble. Our God reigns when that child takes their first breath, and our God reigns when that old man breathes his very last. Our God reigns. Amen. Our God reigns when a pudgy little North Korean dictator threatens to launch a nuclear missile onto our country, and God reigns when that same little pudgy little North Korean or North Vietnam, whatever he is, dictator, is defeated. Our God reigns when right prevails. And our God reigns when evil eclipses. Brothers and sisters, may we be reminded this morning from this psalm that our God doesn't reign only when things are going well. God doesn't only reign when everything is going our way. God doesn't just reign when the blessings are being poured out upon us in abundance. God also reigns when the troubles come our way. God reigns when the evil seems to prevail. God reigns when things are falling apart all around us. Our God reigns. And we have the choice. I have the choice. We can look at our tragedies and our triumphs below, or we can look at God's throne above. Amen?
That really is our choices. We can look at our tragedies and triumphs below, and if that's what we choose to do, our life will be indeed a roller coaster ride. Amen? Because life is full of the triumphs where we rise to the top of the mountain, but there are also a lot of valleys. Amen? Amen. There's a lot of those times when it's dark and it's discouraging and so life is up and down and if, if that's the world we live in then we're riding a roller coaster that's up and down and up and down. But when we look above to God's throne we find strength and security. In fact that's what the psalmist is telling God's people this morning. And, and I want us just to unpack this, this psalm and I've been meditating on it now for a couple of weeks. I came across it in my devotion and, and, and God just spoke to me. I hadn't seen how pregnant this particular psalm is with so much truth. May you, I just share it with you this morning. First of all, I want you to see that our Lord reigns majestically. That our Lord reigns majestically. Notice what he says. The Lord reigns. He is robed in what? Majesty. It's a powerful word in the Hebrew. The word majesty. It literally means to rise. And so it can be translated pride. But we know that with God, it's, it's not a matter of pride. It is a matter that he is risen above all because he is the, what, exalted one. Amen? He is exalted over all the earth. His majesty speaks of his exaltation, that he is above all, that there is none other that is above him. I love what David says in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 27. It says, splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Our God is majestic in that he is exalted. But the word majesty also speaks of his excellence. That he is excellent. That his character is excellent. That his character is, is perfect. Unlike our politicians today, amen? Our God is excellent. His attributes are perfect. The attributes of God. A.W. Tozer speaks of them in, in marvelous terms. J.I. Packer in Knowing God speaks of the wonderful attributes of God. And they lift him above so that we can be proud of our God and worship him no matter what happens because God reigns majestically. We can be proud of our God. We don't have to hang our heads in shame and, and apologize for God that God didn't do this or God didn't do that or why didn't God stop Hurricane Irma or why didn't God stop Hurricane Harvey or why didn't God do this. We can be proud of our God and therefore we can worship Him. It's good to be proud of Yahweh. Amen? It's good to be proud of him, that he rises above in exaltation and excellence. But then I want you to see, second of all, that the Lord reigns boldly. Do you notice what it said? You probably missed this. The Lord, which is the word Yahweh, the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. And then it says, the Lord is robed. Never really thought about it till I really began to get in there and study. What is, what is he saying? The, the Lord is robed. Well, what does a king do when he wants to reign? He puts on his what? His robes. The Lord has dressed to reign. The Lord has dressed to rule. He is not living in a corner somewhere, cowering away, fearful of, of stepping out and speaking out and ruling. He's not ruling under a bunker somewhere like Saddam Hussein or if we begin to rain bombs on North Vietnam someday, that little pudgy dictator will be doing as well, cowering in fear or like Hitler when he was down in his bunker, God stands upon the balcony of his castle and he steps out in his robes. He is reigning boldly. Psalm 104 says Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He reigns boldly and therefore we can boldly declare that he is the Lord because he reigns boldly. 
Even in the darkness, even in the discouragement, even in the depression, even in the degradation, even in the desolation, we are able to stand up and say, Our God reigns and do it boldly. But then third of all, the Lord reigns victoriously. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord has, is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. The king comes out fully clothed, and he has girded himself with strength as his belt. Because as you know, the robe would be placed on and then they would put the belt around that held the robe in place. And the belt here signifies and represents that God is victorious. There is no fear of defeat. God doesn't walk out on the throne or on the balcony of his palace to look out and say, I wonder if I'll win this battle. Rather, he steps out in full assurance, as we sang a moment ago, the full assurance that we have in him, but the full assurance that he has in himself that he will be victorious. Isaiah 63 verse 1 says, Who is this that comes from Eden in crimson garments from Bosroth? He is splendid in his appearance apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I, he says, in righteousness, mighty, say it with me, mighty to save. Our God is mighty to save because he is victorious. Yes, it seems as though we're losing. Yes, it seems as though we're retreating. Yes, it seems as though things are not going the way they are. Yes, it seems as though God is not doing anything. But rest assured, as the psalmist reminds us, our God reigns victorious. Therefore, we can be confident of victory because he does reign victoriously. Amen. 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 We need to be confident of that. Yes, we're going to waver. Yes, we're going to stumble. Yes, we're going to fall. Yes, we're going to have our down days. But folks, in the midst of those down days, the thing that buoys us and that lifts us up and rises us to the occasion is the confidence that no matter what happens, we will be victorious. Because our God is victorious. But then fourth of all, will you look with me? It says the Lord reigns securely. The Lord reigns securely. It, it seems like the, the last part of verse 1 is rather strange. Read it with me. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. And, and we're following the, the line of the communication. And then he says right in the midst of it, yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. It seems like kind of a, an abrupt switch in the verse from the, the robing of the Lord and that, that he is robed in majesty and strength is on his belt. And then suddenly he just says, yes, the world is firmly established. But when we understand it in its context, we see exactly what he's saying. Because he's writing these verses to a people whose world has literally been turned, what, upside down. It, it seems as though the world literally is, is falling apart like a cracker in our hands that, that we crumble. Everything is in upheaval. And they, they felt like literally they're staring at a, a stack of Jenga blocks. If you've ever played Jenga before, you stock them up, stack them up, and then you pull out one block at a time. And you're grabbing that very last one. And you're watching that, that stack of blocks begin to teeter and totter. And you know in a moment that thing is going to fall over. That's the way the people felt at that time. And they wondered if, if, if the world was even going to survive, much like we, we feel like today. What are we hearing? The fear of, again, a nuclear attack by a guy in, in North Korea, that he's launching these, and we're beginning to hear all of these things. We see that saber rattling. Uh, we see the rise of radical Islam and the extreme measures they will go to advance their cause, the resurgence of Russia under Putin's reign, and the, the growth 
growth of communist China. And then we look at our country ideologically and morally, and we see the racial divide and all the things that are, that are going on around us. There is instability everywhere we go. And then you got to listen sometime or another to the global warming crowd. That's telling us all that as we drive our cars and fly our planes, we're destroying the atmosphere and everything's warming up and the world is going to come to an end as we know. And so Al Gore goes all over the world spraying his jet fumes, telling everybody that we're going to all die because of the jet fumes. Hypocrite. <laughs> But during our times of instability, the psalmist reminds us that our God reigns securely. The world is established. It shall never be moved. The reign of God is two-dimensional. He reigns now. That's what he's saying there. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Why shall it never be moved? Is it because that, that we have stopped global warming or we've been able to do this or that? No, the reason why the world is established is because God has established it. I love what Colossians says of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created. All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and visible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. And do you know the last part of it? And in him all things hold together. He is the one that holds all of this together. The elections, the wars, radical Islam, revolutions, they will not determine the future of this world as we know it, ladies and gentlemen. God is in control. Daniel says, Daniel 2.21, he changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. In that very same book, in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar steps out on his palace uh, balcony and looks over and says, look what I've done. And God says, oh, let me show you what you've done. And he reminds him that he is the ruler overall. The fate of our world will not be determined by UN decrees, rants by pudgy little dictators, or the sword of Islam, or any other thing. God is eternally in control of our world affairs. But I want to tell you something, and I'm going to throw this in because I'm sick and tired of hearing it. Global warming will not determine the future of our world. We're already beginning to hear it politicized with the coming of those hurricanes. Look what global warming is doing. It's going to be our demise. It's going to be our end. No, my friends, global warming, nuclear holocaust, and whatever you want to include will not bring our world to the end. Guess who will bring it in? God will bring it to an end. Second Peter Peter chapter 3 verses 5 says they conveniently forget that long ago all the galaxies in this very planet were brought into existence out of watery chaos by God's word. Then God's word brought the chaos back in a flood that destroyed the world. Now listen to what he says. The current galaxies and earth are fuel for the final fire. God is poised, ready to speak his word again, ready to give the signal for the judgment and to destruction of the des desecrating skeptics. In other words, God will decide when this world will end. And God will decide how it will end. Our God no reigns now. Therefore, the world as we know it shall not be moved. It is established. But he reigns forever. Because he goes on to say, your throne, verse 2, is established from of old, and you are from everlasting. Nations rise, dictators rise, they fall, they are defeated. But our God reigns forever. His rule will never be relinquished. His rule will never be diminished. His rule will never be vanquished. Satan has already tried once. Isaiah 14 says, I will ascend unto the throne. I will be like God. And God said, oh, no, you won't. And he cast him out of heaven. 
But in the end of time in the book of Revelation, he is going to try to rise up again and try to resurp that throne. And I want to tell you once again, this time God's going to say, I ain't just going to cast you out of heaven. I'm going to cast you into hell. Man tried to ascend to the throne, didn't we? We built a tower. We'll build a tower to go to heaven so that we can prove we're like God. And God said, oh, no, you won't. And the Jenga tower fell. As Warren Rearsby says, no matter what happens to human rulers on earth, the throne in heaven is safe and secure. Amen. Therefore, we can face uncertain days. Because our God reigns securely. That's comforting, isn't it? I don't like going through it. I don't want to go through storms. I don't like any of that. But to know that I can lift my eyes above the tragedies and triumphs, and I can look to the throne above. But fifth of all, we have much to say. The Lord reigns mightily. Again, rather strange, the floods have lifted up, O oh Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea of the Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Harvey, or whatever it may be. The Lord on high is mighty. In the Old Testament, the word floods, Nahar, is used figuratively to speak of the nations. You take a study of it, you'll see the floods refer to the nations around. And the nations are roaring. They're lifting up their, their voice. There is no God. God is not real. God is a figment of your imagination. We'll repress you. We will oppress you. They've lifted up their voice in threats against God. It's the sound of roaring, the cacophony of voices, cell telling us there is no God, that God has been defeated, that God has been proven to be non-existent. And they're loud and they're intimidating. The sound waves pulsate like the sound of some guy riding down the road with his windows up and the windows are literally just pulsating out. The sound of the voices all around us are great. But in the midst of it all, God reminds us that he is mightier than all those voices. Have you ever been to Niagara Falls and you've heard those waters as they crack cascade over and into the basin below? It's deafening sound. Those voices are deafening, but God's voice rises above them all. To remind us that he is mightier. Therefore, we can experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. When the storms of life come and the rants of mind men assault us, because our God reigns mightily, we can say, it is well with our soul. But I want you to see six of all. We're not done yet. The Lord reigns faithfully. Your decrees are what? Very trustworthy. Now, I'm going to take a little test here today. Take a little poll here, Bruce. Is that okay with you? Okay. How many of you, when the politician stands up and makes his promises, really believe it? Raise your hand. <laughs> We put about as much stock in that as we do in a boat full of holes. Amen? Because we know they're going to tell us things. And they may do some of them. But I want you to know when God speaks, he carries out his word. When he ascends to the power, when he ascends to the throne, and when he speaks and tells us what he is going to do, he will keep his word. We're going to look at that tonight in Psalm 19. You need to be back here tonight where he talks about the law of the Lord is perfect. Why is it perfect? Because words are perfect? No, because the God who spoke them is perfect. Therefore, we can confidently stand on the promises of God, though everyone breaks their word around us. Our God reigns faithfully. Yes, when that 
spouse that said, I'll love you for the rest of my life, walks out of that house and breaks their vow, God's word still stands. Because our God reigns faithfully. But then finally, our God reigns perfectly. What kind of God is he that sits on the throne? Is he a merciless, cruel, heartless dictator like Stalin? A madman like Nazi? A crazy person like Kim Jong? Or a Mullah? No. Holiness befits his house. Don't you get tired? Every day you open up your newspaper, or you go to your app and you pull open the news, some new scandal in the news in there. Some new investigation that's going on of Trump or Clinton or whoever it may be. Scandal in Britain, scandal in Australia, scandal in the uh, Olympic Games. Everywhere we turn, there's scandal and intrigue. But I want you to know something, my friends. When they open up the papers, they'll never find any scandal in the rule of God. Amen. Because he rules perfectly. As one person said, this mighty God is holy, different from any man or woman. His power is holy power. His sovereignty is holy sovereignty. His holiness is connected to all he is and does and could be said to adorn his very house. This is true both for the representation of his house on earth and his ultimate house in heaven. Little wonder when the children of Israel stood on the other side of the Red Sea after God had opened it up for them to walk across and then closed it in on the Egyptian army. They sang a song and they said these words, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing great wonders? We can rest assured that our king, listen to me, will always do what is right. Please hear me say that again. Our God can be trusted that he will always do what is right. It's hard sometimes to see that. Life is not fair. I sat in a house with a lady yesterday for two hours. I was there to sell her insurance, but I ended up counseling her, her walk with God, because she couldn't understand why God had allowed all of this to do, happen in her life, and why he didn't do something to stop it. And, and I'm sure our friends in Houston and those that are living in Florida, why doesn't God stop these things? And, and we wonder and we question, why is God allowing my, my child to, to be racked with cancer in their bodies? And why is my spouse going through this horrific suffering? And, and sometimes we really do wrestle it, but we can can rest assured that our God will always do what is right. And isn't it fitting that he ends with that word forever? The Lord reigns forever and ever and ever. Will you rise? if you want to sing with it this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.